And the new unenhanced DVD player transcends the role of just a movie player and becomes a total interactive entertainment system for the whole family. The PlayStation 2 format famously introduced the DVD format to gamers in 2000, but what if instead, the DVD format introduced gaming to everyone else? That was the goal of the new on chip by VM Labs. A multi-core chip that was capable of video decoding and 3D graphics, the plan was to eventually include the new on chip in every DVD player. It would cost the same as typical MPEG-2 decoder chips common in DVD players at the time, so why not just go with a chip that was also capable of gaming? Aimed at the typical non-gaming audience, it was a bold idea for complete market saturation. Essentially, the same game console would be in every single household. It's for these reasons, I consider it a wonder of the retro gaming world. But obviously, that last part never happened. So, what's the issue? Why don't we all have rather large new on game collections 20 years later? The story begins in the January of 1995. VM Labs is founded by Richard Miller in Silicon Valley. Miller was a vice president of Atari, having worked on the Jaguar. He was also notable for developing the world's first parallel processing graphics workstation with a company called Perihelion. This was licensed to Atari, but was ultimately a commercial failure. Additionally, he was the designer of the Cambridge Z88 portable computer. This was notable, as it was the last computer from Clive Sinclair, having just sold the Sinclair brand to Amstrad a year earlier in 1986. Back to 1995, and development of the Neon chip began with the codename Project X, with an alternative name of Merlin. Much like with the 3DO, the business plan was to license the hardware out, rather than manufacture it themselves. It's no coincidence that 5 out of 6 of the hardware designers had migrated over from the 3DO company, which used a similar business model. Jeff Minter, a notable game designer and lover of chicken vindaloo, sheep, goats and llamas, was also recruited early on to help develop the graphics engines. By 1997, the new on chip was in active production by Motorola, thanks to Miller's previous connections at Atari. Development systems went on sale in December for $7,500, that included development environments supported by Linux, Windows 95, Windows NT, and even Mac, although unofficially. The chip was publicly announced at E3 1998, although it was still known as Project X. A few alternative names were considered, like Active DVD, Activid, and Intervision, but I think we can all agree that these were all naming styles of the time and would have dated quickly. Eventually, Neon was decided on since it was short, snappy, and quote, possessed consonant harmony. Miller himself is quoted as stating, The name Neon reflects the wide-reaching power of a technology capable of introducing millions of consumers to interactive entertainment through their television sets. Notably, the Neon was also capable of real-time ray tracing. Sure, your $1,000 GPU can do that now, but so could a DVD player from the year 2000, apparently. While it did technically work, there was never anything beyond demos showcasing that it was possible, and it never appeared in any games. By 1999, Toshiba had publicly announced interest, and that was the target launch year. But it was Samsung who was ultimately the first market a year late in the May of 2000. The same year, the PS2 was released. Specifically, the Activa DVD N2000 was the first player to include the new on chip, and it retailed for $350. Samsung would go on to release five different new on capable DVD players, with RCA releasing two, and Toshiba releasing just one. In total, only eight games were released officially over the new on's lifetime. There are several franchises you'll recognize though, like the next Tetris DLX and Space Invaders XL. Additionally, both Iron Soldier 3 and Ballistic were also released on the PlayStation. Merlin Racing, with its namesake probably attributed to one of the Nuon's original development names, is a Mario Kart clone that also includes an adventure mode. While not that great of a game, it does showcase the Nuon's 3D capabilities the best. Freefall 3050 AD was another exclusive to the system, where you play a skydiving cop in a futuristic setting. While mostly unplayable using a controller without an analog stick, which the packing controllers didn't include, 
Game Fan Magazine did award it 80 out of 100. This was later ported to the PC, but much further down the timeline in 2019. The new one's killer app, if you will, was Jeff Minter's Tempest 3000. Not only did he help develop the new one itself, but also wrote its best game. The Tempest series has always been successful, and he based the game off Tempest 2000 on the Atari Jaguar. Tempest 3000 has never been released anywhere else, so for the time being, remains the number one reason to purchase a new one. Be careful which player you buy, however. Unfortunately, not all games work with all players. Exacerbated by there not being one unified controller in the first place, Tetris only plays on Toshiba's one player, Ballistic only plays on Samsung systems, and Iron Soldier 3 was recalled because it was found not to play on some earlier systems at all. Lastly, Crayon Shin-Chan 3, based on the anime of the same name, was the only region-locked release. It was only playable on a South Korean-released Samsung Nuon player, and as an extra kicker, none of the other games are compatible with that system either. It doesn't get much more closed off than that. The new one's power was useful for more than games, however. The selection of movies on DVD were enhanced and included extra features like smoother panning and zooming. Even though big names in movie production were involved, like CBS, MGM and 20th Century Fox, only four movies ever took advantage of the chip's capabilities. These movies were Planet of the Apes, and that's the 2001 version with Mark Wahlberg, Doctor Doolittle 2, Bedazzled, and The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Ape Dimension. I can't imagine any of those being a major draw card to the Nuon ecosystem for existing film buffs. Reportedly, a prototype of a Nuon enhanced version of Galaxy Quest was also demoed at the 2001 CES by VM Labs. This included a feature that would show all the best lines from the movie. Groundbreaking. Otherwise, every Nuon player also included the virtual light machine, known as VLM. This is a visual music synthesizer developed by Jeff Minter in 1990. It was originally integrated into the Jaguar CD. The quality of the software ranged between the players, however. Toshiba's only player featured 8 VLM effects, while on the other extreme end of the scale, Samsung's DVD N501 featured 150. There is an interactive mode too, although like with Freefall 3050AD, analog thumbsticks are necessary. Speaking of thumbsticks, there was a range of controllers available from Samsung, Logitech, and Hot Products Incorporated. It appears the Stealth Controller by Hot Products Incorporated and the simply named Nuon Game Controller by Logitech are the best way to go since they do include the thumbstick. There are modern ways around having to find these rare and expensive controllers in the present day, but we'll delve into that later. There were, however, a slew of announced peripherals that never saw the light of day. These include memory cards, light guns, and keyboards, but biggest of all, internet connectivity. A Samsung Activa Flyer promised a modem by the end of 2000 would allow web browsing and email access. This was promised in a few other places too, so it would have been disappointing to the consumers who bought the systems anticipating it as a future feature. Keeping on the train of thought about unrealized potential, a slew of games were promised, but none ever made it to market. There is a rather long list on the Nuon Dome fan site, but notable examples include a maze, Need for Speed 3, Dragon's Lair, Monopoly, and even Riven. There's a prototype for Buster Move 4 out there too, which someone received for playtesting directly from VM Labs in 2001. They've released videos of gameplay online proving its existence, but refused to dump the ROM. I could say nastier things about that point, but let's move on. So, why was all this never released? Yeah, you probably guessed it. By 2001, VM Labs was in a major downfall. While the venture seemed promising at first with major manufacturers and film studios signing on, Nuon failed to take off. Attracting non-gamers was always going to be a difficult task, but it seems as if access to information was badly handled. 
Nuon didn't have the marketing budget of their rivals, which likely led to consumer confusion at the store level. Apart from a small Nuon logo stamped on the front of the players, among a sea of others, Nuon supported DVD players looked identical to their standard counterparts. This early on, they still cost more, so it's not surprising that a non-gaming audience who didn't understand or care about its advantages would choose something cheaper that could still play DVDs. Additionally, it was reported that the few games that were released were often misplaced in store. Again, this will come down to poor education on the product, but it seemed common for the games to disappear into a large shelf full of movies and TV shows. On the topic of the games, VM Labs ultimately failed to entice most AAA publishers and developers. They were mostly working with smaller developers with equally smaller budgets, which meant that VM Labs had to self-publish. This was an expensive prospect for a startup with a small team of employees, especially since there was no prior name recognition to further drive sales. With such a tiny marketing budget, it's no surprise that Freefall 3050 AD reportedly sold less than 10,000 copies. Sadly, in 2001, VM Labs filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. I've read interviews by former employees, and they claim they were just months away from profitability. They were stuck between releasing the first generation of players and receiving the revenues they would eventually provide. They attempted to gain more capital, but the dot-com bubble had already burst. Likewise, 9-11 destroyed the financial market, further hampering funding efforts. Would things have been better if they launched in 1999 as originally intended? Who's to say? Genesis Microchip would buy the company in 2002. Their initial idea was to get cheaper Chinese manufacturers interested, but failed to get anyone on board. The next plan was a deal with Disney, where the new on chip would feature in DVD players aimed at tweens and teens. This too fell through, and by 2003, they had discontinued the chip. This would only be the end of the chip in a commercial sense, however. Thankfully, VM Labs had decided to release a homebrew SDK for the new one in late 2001, presumably as everything was going down the toilet. This has enabled quite a lot of homebrew over the years, which has included an Atari 800 emulator, a Doom port, and many other recreations of classic games like Space Invaders and Pac-Man. Interestingly, a handful of VR Rosie titles also made it across. You can check out a video I made about that lovely PS1 homebrew development kit in this very series if you wish to learn more. These homebrew games could be burnt to CDR, but if you're like me and live in a region where the new one wasn't released, luckily there is another way. Way back in 2002, Mike Perry, known as Riff Online, started development on a Nuon emulator called Nuance. However, Perry sadly passed away in 2007 of a cranial aneurysm at only 32 years old. We know this because his father let the community know of this unfortunate news, but did also release the development files to the community. Fast forward to 2020, Carsten Wachter, known as Toxy Online, picked up the torch and continued development. For this video, the 0.6.4 release was the newest available, and that was released only several months before this upload. It does play games, but is still a work in progress. Thus, not everything runs smoothly. I couldn't get Freefall 3050 AD or Iron Soldier 3 to run at all. Tempest 3000 does launch, but runs incredibly slowly throughout the menus and crashes when I try to start a level. This was disappointing, but I'm looking forward to future updates to the emulator so I can finally play it. On the other hand, Merlin Racing is quite functional. The frame rate is low and it did crash a few times, but it's playable nonetheless. From what other ROMs I have access to, Space Invaders and Ballistic seem to run perfectly. Homebrew is also a bit hit and miss, but most of it is fairly simple so it runs somewhat reliably. Unfortunately, I couldn't get Doom or the Erosi ports to play, so again, I'm looking forward to future updates of Nuance. Songbird Productions, who are known for re-releasing games and accessories for the Jaguar Lynx and Evercade, seem to have taken an interest in the new one. Since 2021, they've reprinted and sold physical copies of Iron Soldier 3 and Freefall 3050 AD. They also developed a USB adapter that allows N64 controllers to be plugged into any new one system. Additionally, ControllerAdapter.com is currently pre-ordering their own version that supports a wide range of controllers, making it much easier for enthusiasts to get into the system. So, at the very least, there is an active community that still supports and still talks about the new one. It may not have been a commercial success, but at least it's not forgotten about. The website, Nuon Dome, currently appears to be the center of the universe for all things Nuon. It includes an active forum, as well as a Discord. So, if you have any questions or general chat related to the new one, I would go there. 
Otherwise, it's tempting to think about what could have happened if the Nuon was successful. It was a great idea that was poorly funded and hampered by critical delays. Who knows what could have happened if it was released in 1999 instead? Could it have beaten the PS2 to the punch and amassed widespread adoption, even though it was nowhere near as powerful? It's an interesting premise to think about, and thus, a certified wonder of the retro gaming world. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Wonders of the Retro Gaming World until the end. All my sources and links to the videos can be found in the description. If you have any ideas for future episodes, please let me know. Otherwise, feel free to check out the existing videos in this series and have a wonderful day.